I'm going to spend the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes talking about uh, some of the most basic elements of uh, interpretation of degenerative uh, disc disease. We'll concentrate just on lumbar disc disease because that is, after all, the most common indication for MR scanning in any practice. So what we will do is uh, describe some of the important nomenclature used and terminology used in degenerative disc disease, emphasize what's important and what is not important to put in any kind of radiology report. I will talk about variants of uh, disc abnormalities, and it's important to uh, know what the variants are. In variants, we talk about uh, entities that uh, don't look like disc disease or herniations, but actually are a manifestation of degenerative disc disease. Uh, so let's talk first about terminology and nomenclature. Uh, the most common thing that people talk about is whether a disc is protruded or extruded. And actuality, although radiologists emphasize the difference between the two, to the surgeons, it doesn't really make that much difference because all they care about is what nerve root is being compressed or uh, compromised by a disc herniation, not particularly whether a disc is protruded or extruded. But nonetheless, it's important to know uh, what the difference is. We also talk about the contours of a normal lumbar disc so that we don't overcall uh, disc bulges, uh, and that's an important consideration we'll get into. Then we'll talk about the annulus, and the annulus, uh, f annular fissures uh, are of various types, and they should be differentiated on any kind of uh, radiology report, and which are important annular fissures and which are not important annular fissures. And then finally, we'll talk about the disc degeneration versus disc uh, desiccation, and often these terms are misused uh, in any kind of report. So let's uh, talk first about the terminology of a dark disc on the T2-weighted image. This is something we commonly see. And you can see here at L5-S1, there is a dark disc. It is incorrect to call this disc uh, desiccation because there's more that's going on in that disc than simple loss of water, which is what desiccation means. There's also, there is a loss of some of the proteins in the uh, uh, collagen content of the disc, so there's many things that are happening. So it's proper to call this loss of T2 signal disc degeneration, not disc desiccation. Incidentally, you will note that here that there is an annular abnormality, which you can see right here, but we'll discuss uh, that uh, corner or rim uh, annular abnormality in a second. So the other important thing is uh, the terminology of disc bulge. This is uh, often overcalled and is a disservice to patients to call everything a disc bulge. In normal patients, it is uh, common to see the shape of the disc at the back of the vertebral body level uh, of different shapes. And here is a cartoon that shows how the shape of the <clears throat> posterior portion of the disc changes as you go down in the lumbar spine from L1-2 to L5-S1. At L5-S1, it actually may have a, 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 a convex contour. That is not a disc bulge. That's normal. Overcalling uh, disc bulges or diffuse herniation is a major uh, problem in the reading and the dictation of MR of a lumbar spine. Uh, <clears throat> and as I said, spines with significant posterior annulus concavity at, at L12 may maintain a slight anterior concavity at L5-S1, but in general, this is the way discs are seen uh, throughout the lumbar spine. Uh, so this is a typical example of a normal disc. An important takeaway, do not overcall bulges. Understand the difference how uh, discs look as we descend in the lumbar spine. And uh, my thought is that when we overcall disc bulges, it actually may make the patient's pain worse. They perceive something is wrong with their spine when there's really not. So be careful of that. Now, we talk about uh, fissures of the annulus. In the past, they have been miscalled as tears. We have to eliminate that term from our dictations because tears imply that something acute is going on and usually fissures of the annulus are 
uh, not acute, but they're uh, progressive, uh, particularly if it's a radial tear. So there's three types of uh, fissures. Uh, and annular fissures may either be a concentric fissure, and that's a separation of the lamella of the outer annulus. Uh, we'll see examples of that. Transverse fissures or corner or rim fissures are defects in the annulus where it attaches to the vertebral end plate. They are defects in Sharpie's fibers. Those two are important because they are seen as a normal part, part of aging. We see this more frequently in older patients. So here is a, uh, a representation of the, <clears throat> of the annulus. These are the inner lamina of the annulus. These are the outer layers of the annulus. And these concentric fissures uh, are secondary to separation of these lamella at this, at this point. Uh, transverse fissures, or what's called rim or corner fissures, are defects in the annulus where they attach the vertebral bodies, uh, and they are defects in what are called Sharpie's fibers. And here's a cartoon that shows where the annulus attaches to the ring hypothesis of a vertebral body. This is with aging, where small uh, fissures occur. They are, again, part of normal aging. So the important one is called a radial fissure. And this is a disruption through the entire width of an annulus or through a portion of it. And you, these usually start in the inner portion of the annulus, suggesting that this degeneration starts at the level of the nucleus pulposus and works its way outward. The fissure actually may be more extensive uh, pathologically than is seen on MR, and that's been shown in uh, many uh, post-mortem studies. And this is what's related to this degeneration. It is this fissure that is a precursor to a herniated disc. So we ought to take a look at this. So that is an annular fissure starting at the inner layer of the annulus and progressing outwards. And you can see how that kind of fissure allows the nuclear material now to herniate out into the spinal canal. So let's look at this. So here's uh, an example of what should be called a concentric fissure. If you look, just do a very cursory look at this, you'll think that this is just, I just call it an annular uh, fissure. But if you look carefully on magnified views, you can see that it's circular in uh, configuration. That is separation of the outer fibers of the annulus, this is a normal parting of aging. And even you can see the same thing here uh, on, on this particular uh, sequence. And here you can see them both as a, uh, as a rounded separation of the annular fibers. And in fact, even on the uh, fast spin echo, you get a feeling that this is a rounded configuration as opposed to a radial fissure. It's an important observation to make. A transverse or corner fissure occurs right, as we said, where the annulus uh, uh, attaches uh, to the vertebral M plate, to the ring apophysis. And uh, this is a, an example of such on a T2-weighted sagittal image. Uh, <clears throat> this, note, this is not radial in configuration. It's important to note that these can uh, be seen either anteriorly or posteriorly, but the anterior ones are frequently those that are not mentioned because our eyes predominantly focus on the posterior portion of the disc. I call your attention to the fact that uh, in most instances, when you look at a spine, the this is the nucleus, this is the common cleft, which is in seen within the nucleus pulposus, and the dark areas, both posterior and anterior, are the annular fibers. If you look at these very carefully and measure them, you will find that the anterior annulus is most often wider and deeper than the posterior annulus. That probably explains why posterior herniations and posterior fissures are more common than those that are seen anteriorly. Uh, how often do we see these corner fissures? 
uh, <clears throat> probably depends on the age, but probably 25% of patients over 50 years of age will see, will show either the corner fissure or a concentric fissure. Now for the important one. The important one is the annular or radial fissure. And you can see here how it is going through the entire width from the inner layers to the outer layers. This provides an egress for uh, nuclear material to herniate through that fissure. If you look at this post-contrast study, you will note that there's actually enhancement around this uh, radial fissure. And people have proposed that when you see enhancement around the radial fissure, those patients are the ones who have pain associated with the fissures. If there's no enhancement, it may not be an active fissure. When you see enhancement like that, it's suspected to being a cause of ongoing pain. The types of uh, disc abnormalities within the spinal canal are listed here. Uh, bulges, protrusions, extrusion, migrated, sequestered, and fragmented discs. And then there are variants of the discs, foraminal discs, far lateral discs, discs anteriorly, discs within the vertebral bodies, discs uh, that degenerate and are called discal cysts, and changes within the disc itself, which we've already talked about. So this is what uh, people refer to as a protruded versus an extruded disc. Protrusion is simply where the top of the disc, or the most posterior portion of the disc, is more narrow than its origin. So that's a protruded disc. An extruded disc is the opposite, where the origin of the disc at the uh, more anterior portion of the herniation is smaller than posteriorly. It is said that the protruded discs are the ones which more likely will be able to regress with time. An extruded disc supposedly has less of an ability to uh, degenerate or to become less voluminous with time. But that is not that important when we dictate these. The important thing is to note what nerve root is being affected and whether it correlates with the patient's symptoms. Uh, if there's no migrated disc or disc fragments, does it really matter what we call it? Probably not. Uh, so what disc nomenclature does matter and why does it matter? So often uh, missed on dictations and observations are discs which are lateral or far lateral. Uh, and it's important because uh, a far lateral disc not only may be missed, but even if it's identified, it may be difficult to reach by the normal surgical approach to uh, disc herniation by the, uh, by the orthopedic or neurosurgeon. If a disc is migrated, and if it goes inferior or posteriorly, it may uh, escape a detection by the surgeon at the time of surgery, particularly if this migrated disc is fragmented into small pieces, you may have leftover pieces of disc material. Sequestered disc, uh, that means that it has removed itself from the parent disc and has uh, migrated either superiorly or inferiorly, and it's important to do a complete search of the epidural space. Failed backs are frequently associated with fragmented discs where a piece of disc is removed but a small piece is left in, and that can cause further problems. Intradural discs are usually in postoperative patients where there's been a weakening of the dura and the disc material in a postoperative patient uh, moves into the uh, subarachnoid space or intradural space, and anterior discs moving anteriorly from the disc space are often, often overlooked, and they, in fact, can be a pain generator. So always mention what discs are posteriorly and look carefully anteriorly because that's often uh, a uh, underestimated cause of pain degeneration. And then discal cysts, we'll talk about now in a second. So uh, on this particular patient, a cursory look at this case shows disc degeneration at the L3-4 level and the spinal canal itself uh, on first glance looks okay. But of 
a close inspection of this shows that this patient not only has a subarticular disc, it has a foraminal disc, but the disc is herniated out into the far lateral uh, area of the spine. You can see how this may be difficult to reach by a standard laminectomy approach. The whole facet would have to come off uh, in order to reach that disc fragment. Far lateral or lateral foraminal disc herniation at L3-4. A sequestered disc versus migrated disc. So a sequestered disc is one where you lose the continuity between the disc fragment and the parent disc. A migrated disc still has some continuity, but uh, the connection between that disc fragment, if you will, and the parent disc may be small. So on this particular example, this disc is clearly behind the body of S1. The question is, is it sequestered, that is removed, or is it migrated? This can be important when the surgeon goes in because you have to know that the fragment is below the parent disc level. If we, and here it is uh, behind the S1 uh, vertebral body. Continuity with the parent disc is the distinguishing characteristic between the two. And if we make, if we look carefully, we see a small attachment that makes this migrated rather than sequestered. So that should go into a report. In this particular case, uh, it would be easy to just say that there are uh, modic changes in the vertebral body above and below this degenerated disc, and that there's some edema within the disc uh, itself. But the important observation here is this is actually a fragmented disc, and this was proven at surgery. If you look at the axial image, you can see a fragment here, another fragment here, a fragment here, and usually, of course, the surgeon likes to go in and take out a whole a piece of disc, remove it at once, but that would not be possible in a case like this. And often, if you go in and just remove this, you'll be left, you would be left with a single fragment, which could cause further problems. So this is a fragmented disc, it has to be removed in small pieces. And we'll finish up with talking about a variant of disc, and that's called a, uh, a discal cyst. So a discal cyst is a degenerated disc, either uh, it has undergone, uh, either has undergone uh, hemorrhage within the disc, or there's been some a response within the disc that has caused it to become liquefied, they can mimic other lesions. And we'll show an example of that. The cysts are located, these discal cysts are in the paramedium or, or lateral area on an axial image and behind the disc space. There's usually a connection between this, uh, these discal cysts and the parent disc itself. And the cysts contain bloody or serous fluid with the cyst wall aligned with fibrous connective tissue, and often you will get enhancement around these discal cysts, and then it becomes uh, at times a difficult diagnosis to make because it can mimic a enhancing uh, cystic lesion of the uh, spinal canal. They're low signal on T1, of course, and high on T2 because they are cystic in nature, and there may be faint rim enhancement. And there may be an inflammatory response, which uh, is the cause of this uh, particular observation. So just for one particular example, and this was a proven discal cyst, you could see that there is disc herniation at this level, and below it is this. And the question is, is this patient just have a small disc protrusion and it has some other abnormality, let's say something like a, a cystic tumor. And no, this is actually a discal cyst. They're connected. You can see how bright it is on a, a T, uh, on the T2 weighted image and its effect on the thecal sac. These are all the roots in the subarachnoid space. So uh, that's a quick rundown of the terminology that's commonly used in uh, uh, reporting degenerative disc disease. Thank you.